you know, the more I'm out in the world and, and see things going on, I think, man, how values have, how many of y'all notice how many, how values have changed? And, you know, some things that I value maybe, maybe aren't that important or maybe it's my own personal preference or, or something like that. But uh, I just look and, and I see people in the stores. I hear the way people talk. I see how people act uh, around each other. I see how people treat one another. And I think, what's happened to our values? And I just want to say this this morning. If my values aren't built upon the Word of God and they're not you know, uh, biblically backed up, then my values aren't that important. Maybe it's my own personal preference, and and that's okay sometimes. Uh, But as a church and as Christians, we ought to have a a, a core set of values that guides us as we walk in this world. And those values must be built and focused on the Word of God. They must be based upon God's principles and God's truth, and the values of the Christian, if it's biblically based, and it's from Scripture, then those values don't change. Okay, those values don't evolve. They don't, they don't, they're not one thing today and something else tomorrow. And I'm going to give you an example of that here in just a moment. So I want to spend some time talking about values and what we should value as a church. And I will say this, this is 10 things here that I, I thought would be, you know, I would just do in a way that, uh, you know, could be remembered and, and kind of something you can think about when you think about our church name. Uh, however, they're not limited to these 10 things. These are just 10 basic things. And we could go, you know, we could make a huge list of of biblical values that every Christian ought to have. But I think if we could just start maybe here with these 10 things, we could go a long ways. And it could really uh, shape the way that we walk in this world. And again, not because I came up with a, you know, a, a catchy deal or, you know, it was just things that I thought of. Listen, again, if they're not biblically based values then they really don't have that much worth. But things that are biblically based, because I know that this, that the Word of God is true. Amen? How many of y'all believe that this morning? That the Word of God is the guideline for Christian living. That, uh, you know, the Word of God doesn't change. Okay, it's not going to be one thing today and something else tomorrow. It's been the same since the beginning. As God gave, uh, you know, gave men... Uh, inspiration by the Holy Spirit to pin down His words. Those words are the Word of God, and they are to be the basis of our life. And those things never change. And I'm, I'm glad for that. I'm glad that we have, you know, gui- a, a, a guideline that isn't going to change tomorrow. I'm glad I know what God said a thousand years ago is still true today, or two thousand years ago is still true today. I'm glad that what God told Moses is still true today. I'm glad that what God said in Genesis is still true today. Amen? Amen. No matter what anybody else says, I know that what God says is absolute truth. His word is truth. And uh, so kind of keeping those things in mind, I I, want to talk about these values this morning. So before we do that, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on the message this morning. Dear God in heaven, I come before you today. Lord, I just need your help to be able to speak truth and, Lord, to speak it right. Lord, if it's my truth, it has no value at all. But, Lord, if it's your truth, it has value that is beyond compare. And, Father, I'm asking you today for grace to be able to preach the truth of the Word of God. And, Lord, I pray that it will have an impact on our lives as we walk through this world this week. And that, God, that you would help us to... Uh, remember the things that are taught in your word, the values that God, your word teaches us, and, and let those become the values of our lives as Christians. And let those values, I pray, guide us, Lord, as we walk in, a, in, in our daily walk. And Father, we just give you the praise and thanks for all that you do. And I ask God that you'd take these words that I try to preach this morning, that you'd sow them into our hearts, and that, Lord, again, that they would have an impact on the way that we live. And we'll give you the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So I want you to remember something I said some time ago, but I do believe it is true. We will be committed to what we value. We will be committed to what we value. If you, if you're, if you don't value something, you will not be very committed to it, right? If you don't value church, big deal if you miss it, okay? And I'm just using that as an example. If I don't value the Word of God, who cares if I read it? Amen? If I don't value prayer, then who cares if I do it? You know, if I don't value my family, who cares what kind of husband I am? Who cares what kind of dad I am? Who cares what kind of grandpa I am? You see, I'm not going to be that committed to what I do not value very much or what I don't value at all. If I don't value something at all, I won't be committed to it at all. Why would I waste my time on something that I do not see valuable, that I do not value, that I do not see as important? So we will be committed to what we value. Our values will guide us as we travel through this life. Okay, my values, what I value is going to have a lot to say about what I do tomorrow. Amen? So what I value tomorrow when I go to work, what I value tomorrow or today when I spend time with my family, what I value while I'm here at church, it's going to have a lot to do with how I act, how I talk, how I walk through this world. It is going to be my guide as I travel through this life. And our values as Christians, as I've already said, must be based upon the principles that are taught in the Bible, which is, again, the Word of God. Amen? I want you to understand that this morning. If, if anything, as a church, that we need to make sure we do is that we believe the whole Word of God. Because I don't see how that we can have a church. I don't see how that we can call ourselves Christians. I don't see how, you know, how we can call ourselves followers of Christ if we do not believe the whole Word of God. Amen? I'm telling you from the very beginning to the very end that I believe this is the Word of God and what is contained in this book has value to my life. Amen? Amen. The Bible talks about, I want you to think about it in this way, the Bible talks about, you know, men sometimes they'll seek for treasure. And the Bible says this about itself, and, I, and this has just kind of popped in my head just now, so forgive me for mis, you know, not quoting it just right. But it talks about wisdom and knowledge. And it says, hey, you seek for her in the book of Proverbs. He says, you seek for her as hid treasure. Amen? You seek for wisdom as hid treasure. Where does my wisdom come from? My wisdom comes from the Word of God. My wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God and performing it in my life. And God says, seek it as hid treasure. Now, if I was to go out here today, and, or if I was in here today, say, hey, listen, there is, there is a, a treasure chest full of gold and rubies and precious stones. And, and I mean, it's a real treasure, and it's buried out there somewhere next to the woods. And everybody, there's a shovel out there for everybody, and the first person that finds it can have it. How many of y'all going to go dig for it? I mean, it's worth untold amounts of money. I think some of us are going to be fairly interested in going out there and digging for that thing. Listen, the Bible says you need to seek after its wisdom as you would a hid treasure. Think about how what people do today. They work so hard. They spend so much effort, so much time, so much energy, so much worry and, 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 and want over worldly treasures that are not going to last. He says, you seek for wisdom. You seek for godly wisdom just like you would have hid treasures, knowing this, that it is far above value than any earthly treasure. Amen? Amen. Amazes me how much time we spend chasing a dollar that is really, I asked Tucker, uh, was it Tucker or Reed yesterday? I don't remember which one of them boys it was. Reed's not here. He's a little bit under the weather. Uh, but I asked one of them boys, I think it was Reed. I asked Reed uh, about, a, a, we were at Walmart. And I asked Reed, I said, what makes this piece of paper worth more than this piece of paper? I had a dollar and I had a 20. I said, just a number on there. I want you to think about that. 
Think about how much effort we put into making a piece of paper that's really not worth anything except the number that's on it. And in this economy, it's worth less and less all the time, right? We all know that every time we go to the grocery store. But I'm telling you this, think about what God says is truly valuable, and that is his word. And he said, you need to seek after it. And it amazes me how much effort we put into making paper as we do, you know, compared to what we, the effort we put in in trying to learn about God's word. And I want you to think about in, that in your life. How much effort do you put into making monetary value than you do spiritual value? Now then, let's just go on uh, here. So, uh, in other words, our values will be shaped by a biblical worldview. My values need to be shaped by a biblical worldview. Not by the view that the world has about life. Because, see, the world values things differently than Christians. Amen? Or at least it should. Now, I know that the world maybe has similar values in some areas. But I want to just give you an example of what I'm talking about here real quickly. If I can get my deal to work. Romans 12, 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. That's a value. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That is a value. We got two values here. Christians should value what? Forgiveness. Amen? Does the world value forgiveness? Not very often. Does the world value maybe getting even and getting revenge? Uh, quite a bit. Okay? And uh, I want you to think about the last part of that verse. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So we as Christians should value what? Honesty. Amen? Well, the, the world says, well, we value honesty. But their value about honesty, for the most part, is subject. And what I mean by that is the world says, yeah, well, we need to be honest. But if it's more expedient to tell a lie, or it's more convenient, or maybe, you know, the circumstances are such that we can tell a lie, then that's okay. You see, they don't truly value very much honesty. But the Christians should value honesty to the point that we provide things honest in the sight of who? All men. Okay? And so I just want to use that as an example this morning and let you see where I'm, I'm going with this sermon. And that is this, that there are certain things that Christians should value and those things do not change. What I value today in Christ, I should value tomorrow in Christ, and uh, so on. So, so let's take a look at the values, again, that I uh, put together uh, some time ago. I'm not going to read all these off. We're going to go through them over a period of time here. But we're going to look at the first one this morning, and that is Christ-centered. Absolutely First and foremost, as a church, we must be a Christ-centered people. Amen? In other words, when I say Christ-centered, I'm talking about Christ first. That he can't be second place in our life. He can't be second place in what we're doing. He can't be second place in what we're teaching. He can't be second place in our worship. And how many all know that we can do all those things and put Christ somewhere where he doesn't belong? And that's in second or third or fourth place. How many of y'all know that there are churches in America today that, that, you know, worship and they do all this stuff, but it really is all about them and not so much about Christ? How many of y'all know that happens? How many of y'all know that there's people that are going to be in church this morning and they're going to be there saying they're there for Jesus, but in all reality they are there for themselves and they're there trying to fulfill an obligation or a duty and they really don't care that much about Jesus? I'm telling you, there's people sitting in churches in America right now, all across America. There's people in every church that say they are Christians, but they really do not care about the things of Christ. Amen? We must be a Christ-centered people. So I want to, you know, think about taking a look at these, these, these values, these ten things. Again, I want to say it again. This list is not extensive. 
And I know that many more things could be added to it. However, I do believe that these values can help us in the pursuit of our visions. So I want you to think about that. Our visions to reach unchurched or unsaved people in our community and provide them with the tools of growth so that they can become mature Christians. Okay, not just in name only, but they would truly be born again. We would be as a church, we're Christ-centered and we're leading people to Christ. And not only we are leading them to Christ, but we're going to, as Christians, help them to be able to grow and mature. And in return, they will begin to lead others to Christ. And those people will become invested in their growth. It's just kind of like, uh, like this. I help somebody. I witness to somebody. I, I, I you know, share the, the gospel of Christ with somebody. And that person becomes a believer. They become a Christian. And now I'm going to become invested in their life. And I'm going to make sure on an individual level that I'm going to help, th- I'm going to help them to grow as a Christian. So that they can begin to win others to Christ. And then they themselves can help those people to grow as Christians. What if it worked that way? Wouldn't that be awesome? We'd see church growth. And we'd see church growth not just for growth's sake. Not just because church is fun. But we would see church growth because people are truly being converted and born again. And becoming followers of Jesus. Amen? And that's what we need. We don't need a bigger church for a bigger church's sake. We need a bigger church because people are truly being transformed by the power of God. Amen? Amen. How awesome would it be if we could take lives that are broken and help them to come into the presence of the Savior and come into the knowledge of Christ and their lives be transformed by the power of God and those people become actively involved in helping others be transformed by the power of God. That is an awesome thing to think about. If you go back into the early church in the book of Acts, you would find that very principle being performed by the early church. People's lives were being totally changed by the power of God. And those people were changing or leading others to be changed by the power of God. i got to be careful about my wording here because I want to tell you this. I personally can change nobody. I don't like it when people say, well, I was saved by Brother Shane. Listen, I ain't saved nobody. Amen? But I can give you truth that can bring you to the knowledge of Christ. And it is the power of God that saves. So anyway, I want us to think about this being Christ-centered again. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 23, says, The eyes of our, your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now I want you to understand something this morning, and I've I've read several verses really to get to this last point, and that is the church is what? It's his body. And if it's his body, he has to be the center focus. Amen? Amen? Listen, the Bible describes him as being the head of the church. As a matter of fact, it says that he has put him the head over all things to the church. Jesus is the focus. And if Jesus is not the focus of our church, if he is not the focus of our life, if he is not the focus of what we do and how we act and how we live, then he's not in his proper place as Christians. You see, Jesus has to be the center. Jesus has to be 
the focus. Put him in his proper place. And I'm going to tell you this. And I, again, I don't want to use my words to, to confuse anybody. I want you to know this. I don't manipulate God in putting him in a certain place. But what I'm saying is this, that I, on a personal level, need to put Jesus in his proper place in my life, and that is the head over me. Amen? The center of my life. And it says the church is his body. It is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And I want to give you another passage of Scripture. I've been studying in the book of Jeremiah here of lately. The parallels between the, the, the children of Israel in the book of Jeremiah and Christians today in modern America, there is such parallels between the two. Okay, so as I read Jeremiah, I think about where we're at as a nation. I think about where we're at as, a, as a, an American church. And I think about, you know, what Jeremiah had to say to the children of Israel. I think the message would be very similar at least to church in America today. So let's take a look at that. In Jeremiah 7, 1 through 4, he tells us here, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust you not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Now let me tell you what he's talking about here. Josiah was the king in Israel. He had just become... He had, become king, and I think he's about 26 years old at the very writing of this prophecy right here. Him and Jeremiah, I think, were probably good friends. Josiah, the king of, Israel, the king of Judah at that time, he was a godly man. He was eight years old when he became king. Tucker is seven, going on eight. Now, I want you to think about little Tucker over here being a king here in just a few months. Now, that's something to think about. You say, man, was a little kid running the land? Oh, I think he had lots of advisors and people helping him along the way. However, when he was about 16 years old, he began to understand the things of God. And his heart began to draw close to God. And he began to take and turn the nation back to God. And when he's 26 years old, he begins to understand that the temple of the Lord in the land of, of in, in Jerusalem had suffered. See, they the people had quit going to the temple. People had quit doing the things that the Mosaic law had commanded them to do, and they'd gotten completely away from it. And Josiah began to understand we need to, we need to tend to the things of the temple. It had become into total disrepair. And he began to uh, tell the people, he, he appointed people over, and he said, listen, I want you to repair the damage at the, in the temple. I want you to restore it where it's a place of worship once again. And so that's what they did. And while they were doing that, they found a copy of the law of God. They found a copy of the Word of God, the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and, Number De and Deuteronomy. And when they found it, they took it to Josiah and they said, listen, look, we found a copy of the word of God. And he read it. Now, the word of God had been absent from the people for a long time. And he read the word of God and he, he began to understand, man, we have gotten away from God so far. And he repented and he helped the people to come into a place of, of understanding. Of, he had the word of God read aloud to them. And they began the process of revival in their land. However, they repaired the temple. They restored it to its beauty. Temple worship became a popular thing. Everybody's going to temple. However, the people's hearts were not right. They were doing it on a surface with surface value. 
Their everyday life was not speaking of it. And, and if you was to go on and read here in this seventh chapter of Jeremiah, you would find that Jeremiah uh, has a lot to say about that and where the Lord has a lot to say about that. And he begins to remind them, listen, you all are doing things. You're going to temple and you're saying how wonderful it is. And when it says, trust not in lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, are these? What they were saying is they were going to temple and they're saying, wow, look at this. How wonderful it is to go to church. How wonderful it is to be here at temple. How wonderful this building looks. How wonderful the priest looks. How wonderful it is that we're doing all these offerings and sacrifices again. And they were just all about temple worship. But when they uh, went back to work the next day, they were lying they were stealing. They were committing idolatry. They were committing adultery. They were going right back to their old way of living. And you know what God said about that? You can go to temple all you want, but if it ain't changing your heart, it's not no good. Amen? Isn't that what we see in America today? Isn't that what we see in, 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 in modern Christianity on so many fronts? Is people saying, wow, look at the church. Wow, look at all this. Wow, look at the worship. And yet they go to work on Monday and they don't even act like Christians. Jesus is saying to them, God is saying to these people here, it's all trash. If your heart isn't changed, don't tell me you're repenting if you are not turning away from sin. That's a joke. Amen. Let's look on in Jeremiah 7, 8, and 10. And you should read the verses in between as well, but let's look here. It says, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense on the Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not? And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do those abominations, delivered to do all these abominations. You know what they were saying? They were saying, hey, we're going to temple, so that ought to give us the right to live however we want. We're Christians, therefore I can just do whatever I want. That's not what he's saying. God says that's not the way this is. They thought they were doing God so much favor in coming to church that, that he would excuse what they were doing on Monday. Isn't that what he's saying here? That's exactly what he's saying. They thought, man, I can just, man, I go to church. God will be so thrilled with me. He won't care what I do every other day of the week. And I'm just here to tell you this morning that God says that's not what you, you, you don't value me. If you value me, God's saying, if you valued me and if I was the center focus of your life, it will change how you live. Amen? It will change how you act. It will change what you do. You see, the church is his body. And I want you to think about that, the scripture I read there in Ephesians and think about it in this way. The church is his body, is the fullness belonging to him who created and fills the universe with all things. That is, Jesus who wise, wisely and skillfully fills and created the universe with all material elements necessary for its existence, also infuses with the same power His people by the Holy Spirit, His own life, and his character. And what I'm saying is this. Think about who holds the universe together by the power of his word. It is Jesus Christ. And to think about the same Jesus who holds it all together. Empowers me to be able to live for him. That ought to change me. When he becomes the center focus of my life. Then I, I'm focusing on the creator of all things. I want you to think about this. He, as I've already said, he infuses his people by the Holy Spirit. His own life and his own character. 
I want to ask you something this morning. I want to ask myself something this morning. When I work tomorrow, when I go through my week this week, is the character of Jesus going to be evident in my life? This is a wonderful thing to know the one who holds the universe together has filled us with such power and grace and life. And if Christ is the center of our life, his power, grace, and life should be flowing out from us. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And I know I quote this scripture a lot, but now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest or makes known the smell or savor of his knowledge by us in what? Repeat it with me. By what? By us in every place. That means everywhere I go. Not just here at church. Amen? Not just around certain people. Listen, I, it cracks me up sometimes. I, people find out I'm a preacher and they're cussing. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm just a man. Amen? And if you think you're going to be all right with God because you change your language around me, you're, you're playing a hopeless game. I'm just telling you this. When you're around the preacher, or when you're around somebody from church and you're acting different because you don't want them to know they're from church, you're not fooling God. Amen? Then people that you work with, are you the same people, are you the same person there as you are here? Are you the same person around them as you are around me or someone else from church? You see, he says that we are to be the smell of Christ in every place. Not just certain places, not just things that I want. I want to ask you a few questions this morning. Is Christ the center of all that we do here at church? Now, I want to talk to you Sunday school teachers. I want to talk to anybody that's in any leadership position in this church, myself included. But is Christ the center of all that we teach? Is Christ the center in all that we do? We got Bible school this week, obviously. But is it the decorations and all that kind of stuff that is the center? Those things are important. And, those, and then like Grant said a while ago, thank you for everybody that got in and helped with that. Thank you for everybody that will get in and help with Bible school this week. Thank you for everybody that will be involved with that. But here's the deal. Is Bible school the focus or is Jesus the focus? And what I mean by that, you say, can you have Bible school without Jesus being the focus? I promise you it happens every year in all kinds of churches. They have Bible school for Bible school's sake and Jesus gets forgotten. Amen? It can happen. It can happen in a, war, in, in a church service or whatever. Jesus must be the center of all that we do, all that we teach. Is Christ the center of our lives outside of the church? Is he the center of our families? Husband, is he the center of your family? Wife, is he the center of your family? Children, is he the center of your family? Mom and dad, is he the center of your family? Listen, is Christ the center of all that we do? Is he the center of our decisions? The things that I decide to do or not to do, is Jesus the center of it? You know how much trouble it would save us if we would just put Jesus in his proper place in the center of our lives before we make decisions? Amen? How many decisions have we made that we've regretted so badly later? Things that we can't change, things that have messed us up. And we think, man, I wish I'd have made a different decision. I wish I'd have made a different choice. 
If Jesus was a sinner, we would make the right choices. Would we be guided by his Holy Spirit? Is he the center of how we interact with other people? How that we treat them? How that we talk to them? How that we witness to them? When Jesus becomes the center of our life, I can promise you the way that you interact with people will change. You will begin to see people differently. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as what? Dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Jesus needs to be the sinner. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. When Jesus is the sinner, we're walking in Christ. We are in Christ. We're walking as children of light. Amen? Remember what Paul says, Remember you not that you're children of light? Walk as children of light. Jesus said that he was the light of the world. Jesus needs to be the center. And then last of all, Jeremiah 7, 23 but this, thing command, <clears throat> but this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. And the reason I picked this verse is, is God says, God is saying here through his prophet Jeremiah, God says, I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice. Put me in my proper place, and that is Lord of your life. Put me at my proper place, and that is the center of, of your life. He says, Obey my voice, and I will be what? Your God. And you shall be what? My people. Man, we need to put Jesus in his proper place. Amen? Jesus must be, as a church, we should value Christ-centered living. We should value Christ-centered teaching. We should value Christ-centered preaching. We should value Christ-centered families. Christ-centered living. Jesus needs to be first. Do you value that? What you do tomorrow will testify as to what you truly value. How you live tomorrow will testify whether Christ is number one in your life. Amen? Because if He is, it will change you. And you'll be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ.